Welcome back. The latest wave of U.S. sanctions against Russia have gone into effect, and they're a punishment for Moscow's alleged involvement in the poisoning of former spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia. The Kremlin is already promising a proportional response. Jim Rickards joins me now. He's the author of the bestseller The Road to Ruin and an editor at Strategic Intelligence. So happy to have you on the show today. You know, uh, we're seeing Russia continuing to get hit with sanctions. The big question here, are they making a dent? Are they making a difference? Uh, Allison, maybe a small dent, but not a large one. Uh, the Russian economy is the 12th largest in the world, uh, one of the three largest oil exporters, major natural resource exporters. So they're having some effect, but uh, their central bank has managed the situation very well. Uh, and I think it's important to know that this is a two-way street. Uh, the idea that the U.S. is sort of, omnipotent and throw sanctions on Russia to get what they want. It's a little truth in that, but Russia is pushing back. Putin's not the kind of guy to sort of stand still and take it. So their, their response is asymmetric, you know, meddling in the 2016 election, uh, cyber financial warfare, some sanctions on the U.S., uh, and most importantly, dumping treasuries and buying gold to get out from under the dollar hegemony. So this is a, this is a financial war. It's been going on for a long time. Let's talk more about this strategy here where Russia is really ramping up these purchases of gold. Official data showing that Russia added almost 29 tons of gold to its reserves in July. Uh, the central bank now worth an estimated $76 billion. How much does this help shield Russia from these sanctions? It helps a lot. And the important thing, you know, the July increase caught a lot of attention, I think, for two reasons. Number one, they passed China, so that's a big deal. And they're getting close to 2,000 tons, which is a nice round number. But it's important to understand this has been going on for 10 years. You go back 10 years, Russia's gold reserves were 600 tons. Today, they're almost 2,000 tons. So they've tripled their gold reserves in the past 10 years. And the gold market's funny. It, it's liquid. It, you can always buy or sell. But it's also thinly traded. So you have to watch out for market impacts. So Russia, what they do, they have what's called a standing order. They just tell their dealers and banks, look, uh, we, I want to increase my gold reserves, but I don't want too much market impact. So whether it's 10 tons... 20 tons. Just keep buying it. They've been very transparent, which is smart, so they don't shock the market. But, uh, you know, 10 to 30 tons a month for 10 years, that's how they got up to 2,000 tons. So this has been going on for a very long time. In uh, 2009, I uh, facilitated a financial war game for the Pentagon, and we warned the Pentagon about this. We said, this is happening. It's going to happen. We kind of we got laughed at by the Harvard professors, but it's turned out to be exactly right. Okay, so as we see uh, Russia pile on this gold and sell U.S. treasuries, what are the implications for the dollar as the world's reserve currency? Well, the dollar's position is very strong. It's uh, about 60% of global reserves, 80% of global <laughs> payments, and close to 100% of all uh, oil pricing. Uh, so you look at that and say, well, this is impregnable. You can't, you can't take it down. But you could have said something similar about sterling in 1913. And within a year, with the outbreak of World War I, sterling was already in long-term decline. And by 1944 with Bretton Woods, it was, it was almost a footnote. So these things can change. Uh, they don't change overnight, but they can change quickly. What's important is that Russia's adding gold reserves, but so is China, Turkey, Iran, and a lot of other countries. This is what I call the new axis of gold. The U.S. is... Uh, the, is I talked to the Pentagon, the Treasury, and the Fed. The Pentagon gets it, but they don't have any authority over the dollar. The Treasury seems to be asleep at the switch. The intelligence community is kind of blasé. I talked to the highest-ranking economic uh, uh, officer in the intelligence community, and he said, eh, somebody's got to own it, you know, as if it were a yard sale, used furniture or something. But they're, they're missing the bigger picture, which is that all these countries are trying to get out from under dollar hegemony, and that's going to happen. And then there goes the power of the U.S. to impose these sanctions, right? Correct, because if you, uh, first of all, they're all building alternate payment systems. Even the German foreign minister the other day said Europe needs an alternate payment system. Uh, they could do cryptocurrencies. I'm, I'm not saying buy Bitcoin. I, I, I don't like Bitcoin <laughs> at all. But you could create a new cryptocurrency uh, with a distributed ledger uh, with China and Putin. So imagine a Xi coin and a Putin coin. They could denominate it in SDRs. That's a special drawing right. That's the world money that comes from mm -hmm. the IMF. They could they could back it up with gold. And notice that the dollar is not involved. Everything I just described doesn't involve the dollar. So that's why this could, if the U.S. doesn't reassert dollar hegemony, one good way to do that would be if the U.S. started buying more gold. I don't expect that to happen, but that would be uh, you know part of my advice. If the U.S. doesn't do that, again, this this whole alternate system, it's being created now. This is not science fiction, but it, it, it could affect the dollar very, very uh, rapidly.
Jim Rickards, uh, editor of Strategic Intelligence and author of Road to Ruin, thanks so much for your analysis.